Good morning, everyone. It's lovely to be with you all. Good morning to everyone on Zoom. We've got folks calling in. Uh, I saw we've got folks from Dingwall, um, from East Lothian, from Barnet, um, and other folks in Medrum as well. So from everyone in the church, we want to give the, our folks on Zoom a big wave. And on Zoom, you want to give us a wee wave back. Uh, hopefully you'll be able to see us uh, even clearer. We've got a new uh, camera now in the church, so uh, we'll be in HD, which is good because we've been making do with some, some wee webcams, uh, but we, I think we got a grant for that actually, um, and so now we're really uh, in the 21st century now. Just before we begin, uh, a few announcements. Um, uh, if you haven't already, you should come up by our intern, Thomas. Thomas, how many more weeks do you have with us? He doesn't know, <laughs> two or three. The, the clock is ticking, it, but if you haven't popped down, he's in the church grounds between three and five, uh, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, so uh, every weekday apart from Wednesday, and um, so if you have a chance, you should pop down and say hello. Uh, on Friday, also, we had our first family drop-in, and um, we're running that now on Fridays between 11 and 1. Uh, it went really well, actually. We had a really interesting mix of families, um, some old badger carpet families, uh, people from other places, but uh, it went well. So if you know any families, um, do let them know about that. It's a place where they can pop down, have a cup of tea, and their kids can have a wee play. Uh, and if it's thing, something you might want to help with, that would be really good. Um, if Even if you wanted to come down just for half an hour or something, just to kind of be on board. It's the easiest job we can give you. You just need to be able to drink a cup of tea and chat to people. So most of us should be qualified for that. Um, but if that's something you're interested in, just let me know. I think that's all our announcements for today. So I think we should begin, as we always do, uh, with a psalm. And our reading today comes from Psalm 90. So if I say the words uh, that aren't in bold, and we can repeat together the words that are in bold. So Psalm 90. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the whole world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn people back to dust, saying, return to dust, you mortals. A thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by, or like a watch in the night. If only we knew the power of your anger, your wrath is as great as the fear that is your due. Teach us to number our days, that may we gain a heart of wisdom. Relent, Lord, how long will it be? Have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love, that may we sing for joy and be glad all our days. May the favour of the Lord our God rest on us. Establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. We're now going to sing now our first hymn, Immortal Invisible.
I'd like to invite Nori up, who's going to be reading our first reading from the Old Testament. Our first reading this morning is from Ecclesiastes, chapter 3, verses 1 to 15. A time for everything. Everything that happens in this world happens at the time God chooses. He sets the time for birth and the time for death, the time for planting and the time for pulling up, the time for killing and the time for healing, the time for tearing down and the time for building. He sets the time for sorrow and the time for joy the time for mourning, the time for dancing, the time for making love, and the time for not making love, the time for kissing, the time for not kissing. He sets the time for finding and the time for losing, the time for saving and the time for throwing away, the time for tearing, the time for mending, the time for silence and the time for talk. He sets the time for love and the time for hate, the time for war and the time for peace. What do we gain from all our work? I know the heavy burdens that God has laid on us. He has set the right time for everything. He has given us a desire to know the future, but never gives us the satisfaction of fully understanding what he does. So I realize that all we can do is be happy and do the best we can while we are still alive. All of us should eat and drink and enjoy what we have worked for. It is God's gift. I know that everything God does will not last forever. Will, sorry, last forever. You can't add anything to it or take anything away from it. The one thing God does is to make us stand in awe of him. Whatever happens or can happen has already happened before. God makes the same thing happen again and again. God bless his word. Now I realize that this is where... Um, we need to remember that we're a church that's now in multiple places because I was going to talk about something, but I realized it won't be the same for everyone because we are in Scotland. And in Scotland, it's a big week because what happened this week? The schools went back. And that means that we'll be able to hear that lovely. We have a school right across um, from us. So you'll, we'll soon be able to hear the lovely sound of children screaming their heads off. Not sure if they're having fun or being murdered, but that kind of that real kind of horrifying scream they do. But there's another sound that we hear at this church because we're just next door and we're going to be hearing a lot more of. Uh, Chance, can we have the sound? Now, you all recognize that, don't you? The sound of the school bell. But what does that mean? Well, it, de it depends, doesn't it? Because what, what does that mean at the start of the day? School starting. What does it mean in the middle of the day? It's break, it's lunch, it's you're gonna, or it's the end of lunch. And what does it mean at the end of the day? And how does it feel at the end, you know, end of a long and hard day? How does that sound feel? Good, release, sweet freedom. And just before that PE lesson that you've been dreading, doesn't feel so good, doesn't it? The bell means different things depending on when it is, depending on how you're feeling. But the one thing it means, always means, is change. That whenever you hear that bell, you know that something, thank you, <laughs> is going to change. And my rest of my sermon is about unpredictability, so I'm, I'm glad you're keeping me on my toes. Um, but you can tell things are changing. If you look at the trees at the moment, you'll start to see fruit in them. That's the sign of getting towards the end of summer. Uh, and then soon the leaves will fall from their trees, and that will be autumn, and then the the it will be bare and it will be winter and then we'll see things growing up and it'll be spring and again and again the seasons change because nothing in life really stays the same does it 
everything changes. Everything around us is growing and changing, beginning and ending. And as it said in our passage today, God made it this way and made everything beautiful in its own time. But change can be hard. If you heard in that reading we had today, um, the, the writer of it put that big list of and all the different ways that life can change. Um, and if you see some of them, you know, some of them look great, don't they? A time for love, for joy, for dancing. Those sound like great changes. Wouldn't it be lovely if the next change in life meant more dancing? But then there's other changes in there that aren't going to be so great. Time for sorrow, for tearing down, for losing. Those are things you know, we'd rather avoid. But the trouble is that we can't stop change from happening. Change always happens. You know, just no matter how much we want it to, the school bell always rings, whether we like it or not. But the one thing that never changes through all these things is God. The Bible tells us that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God loves us, and we know that that love isn't going to go away. And so when life is changing, we can always ask for God's help because God is with us on the first day of school and the last day of our job, every hello and goodbye. We can always know that God is there with us through every change. So let us pray now together about that. And we'll say together at the end the words of the Lord's Prayer. But let us pray. God, you are outside time and that is a great gift to us. Because we don't know the future. We don't know what changes are going to come. And that can be scary and difficult. But you know what's coming and you are always with us. So we pray that we can learn to rely on you. That we can use your, your strength and your encouragement to get us through every single change. Help us to enjoy the good changes, the times of love and dancing. And help us to make it through the tougher times but we are glad that you are always with us and that we can always rely on you. And just as Christians have prayed through the centuries, we turn to the words that Jesus taught us to pray, praying together saying, our father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Uh, I'd like to invite, I believe Dorothy is going to be taking our reading from the New Testament. So are you okay with that? Thank you, David. Um, the second reading is taken from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 26, starting at verse 19, where Paul tells King Agrippa about his preaching. After that, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem and throughout the countryside of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God and do deeds consistent with repentance. For this reason, the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. To this day, I have had help from God. And so I stand here testifying to both small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would take place, that the Messiah must suffer and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. While he was making this defense, Festus exclaimed, you're out of your mind, Paul. Too much learning is driving you insane. But Paul said, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I am speaking the sober truth. Indeed, the king knows about these things and to him I speak freely. For I am certain that none of these things has escaped his notice, for this was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. Agrippa said to Paul, are you so quickly persuading me to become a Christian? Paul replied, whether quickly or not, 
I pray to God that not only you, but also all who are listening to me today might become such as I am, except for these chains. Then the king got up and with him, the governor and Bernice and those who had been seated with them. And as they were leaving, they said to one another, this man is doing nothing to deserve death or imprisonment. Agrippa said to Festus, this man could have been set free if he had not appealed to the emperor. Thanks be to God. Thank you. Alice and I have been um, listening back to old episodes of our podcast we've been enjoying, and they're a few years old now. And so at some point in this, they, they, the, the hosts have announced they're going on tour. And this isn't just any tour, you know, they're going to be traveling to um, Australia, America, Canada, across Europe. This is going to be a proper world tour. They were really excited about it. So in the, in the end of the fifth season, they, they let people know tickets are on sale now. Join us for our 2020 world tour. How do you think it went? <laughs> it's very strange listening to it. You're just sitting there to these people from just a couple of years ago thinking, you've no idea what's coming, do you? You've got absolutely no idea of what is on the horizon. But then none of us did, did we? That was such a strange year, wasn't it? We had dates in the diary. We had tickets booked. We had these things that we thought we were going to do. And then life took a different direction. And all of a sudden, quite a lot of things ended up being thrown out of the window. I think we all like the idea that we could plan our lives, uh, whether that's small things like bookings, like you know, picking a table in a restaurant, but also the bigger things like where you want to do a go with your career, where you want to be in five, 10 years. But the problem is that well, we aren't always in control. Life throws us curveballs. And like we were seeing in that first reading, you know, some of these are good things, but often, actually, those are things that we don't want to see happen. But whatever it is, whether we move, we get promoted, we lose our job, we get sick, we lose people, the world goes into lockdown, anything can happen, and we just can't predict it. See, there were two people who understood the unpredictability of life really well. And one of them was the author of our first reading. So we read from Ecclesiastes, and Ecclesiastes is, it records the, the writings of someone that's an only known to us as the teacher. And famously, it has one of the most explosive openings in all of the Bible. The beginning of that book starts, it's useless, useless, said the teacher. Life is useless, all useless. You spend your life working, laboring, and what do you have to show for it? And it only goes on from there. It's a pretty intense book. But that word useless, if you remember older translations, you'll have heard it vanity, vanity, everything is vanity, or in some translations, it's life is meaningless. But the actual original word is a Hebrew word. If we skip forward to, it's a Hebrew word called hevel. Um, and what it means essentially is like smoke or vapor. So like when you blow out a candle and you see the smoke. And so what the writer of Ecclesiastes is saying, it's not so much that life is meaningless, but that life is like smoke. It's real, you can see it, but the minute you try and grab a hold of it, all of a sudden it dissipates. And he goes through the whole book of Ecclesiastes is him going through all the ways that life can be like smoke, that when you think you've got a grasp of it, actually things can slip from your fingers. So what could you do with your life? You could try spending your life seeking pleasure. Well, pleasure is feeding you. Know, it's here today, but gone tomorrow. Maybe you could try and become famous, but then everybody gets forgotten eventually. And, you know, how many people remember their great-great-grandparents? Most people's names get lost. You could try and become rich, but then, well, you can't take it with you and only add to your worries. And he says, even wisdom, that great thing comes to an end. Hevel, hevel, everything is smoke. That's what he's saying in this book. And it's, if you can't realize, yes, it is quite an angsty book, but he has a point. Things around us that can feel so permanent and unchanging are often more fragile than we realize. And that, that might be the whole story of 2020, wasn't it? That things that we thought could never change, all of a sudden we realized, actually, their circumstances can make things that we thought were fixed much more difficult. But then the other person who understood that life could be unpredictable was Paul. Um, 
I find that it's really interesting. Well, this image of Paul actually was discovered only a few years ago. Um, but Paul had a plan once. You know, when Paul was a young man, his life had a plan. He was a promising, gifted scholar. He had a bright future. He trained under the greatest teacher of his generation. And he would have expected to grow up, uh, become a rabbi. Maybe he would join the Sanhedrin, the kind of the ruling council of elders. And he would probably grow old and retire a wise and respected man. But then he met Jesus, and that changes everything. Where once Paul's life had a plan, when he started following Jesus, that all went out the window. Paul would spend his whole life traveling, sleeping in borrowed beds, going from place to place. He would never really know what was going to happen next. And things were always being derailed from him. So in the reading we had today, it was, we find Paul under arrest. You see, he had tried to go back to Jerusalem, and there he'd been arrested uh, and tried, and he basically for just being a public nuisance. Um, but the Romans had no charges, so all they could do was throw him into house arrest and leave him there. And they forgot about him for two whole years. Uh, can you remember back to two years ago today? So the 22nd of August, 2019. I feel like quite a lot of water's gone under the bridge since then. But that's how long Paul was left in limbo. The, the Romans, as much as they were conquerors, loved a bit of bureaucracy as well. And they just let him languish as they kicked around his case. And yeah, any plans that Paul had, had to be thrown out of the window as he left, lived this life in limbo. He was living in that hevel state. Nothing was solid. Everything was like smoke. So how did these two people then, the, the, the teacher from Ecclesiastes and Paul the Apostle, how did they learn to live with the fact that their lives were unpredictable and they didn't know what was going to come next? Well, for the teacher, his answer lies very much in the present moment. In the middle of all that negativity in Ecclesiastes, there's verses like the one that we read in our reading today. And it said, um, so I realized that all we can do is be happy and do the best that we can while we are alive. All of us should eat and drink and enjoy what we have worked for. This is God's gift. So what does the teacher say? If you can't control your life, stop trying. You cannot know what tomorrow will bring, but you know what is in front of you today. So enjoy it. Enjoy the simple pleasures of life. Eat good food, do satisfying work, have conversations with friends and loved ones. This now is what you have embrace it. It's something we don't really talk so much about in church, is it? We normally think about what you ought to do, what you should do, but actually in different places in the Bible, there is this encouragement to make the most of the day that you have in front of you. And I think it's good advice because how often, I don't know about you, but I certainly find this, how often do you find yourself not enjoying the moment you're in because you're worried about what's going to come in the future? I don't know what you do when you get anxious, but I learned very much during the first lockdown that when I am worried about something, what do I do? The phone comes out and there's always another video and there's always another feed to scroll through. But I found that while I was worrying about all that was going on in the world, I was just scrolling and scrolling. And I wasn't exactly living my best life while I was doing it. But we all have things like that. You know, people discovered in lockdown that maybe they're stress cleaners and all of a sudden every door handle in their house is polished within an inch of their life. Some people are stress workers. People just scurry about trying to keep themselves busy. We all do these things when we're worried. But whatever it is, what it usually has in common is we're not exactly living our best life in the here and now. It was Jesus who said, do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about itself. Who can add a day to their life by worrying? So this is the wisdom of the teacher. We should embrace the days that we have and make the most of it. Or as it says in the Psalms, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Yes, so this is the message that the teacher used in order to deal with the fact that if life is hard and, and there's, you can't grab a hold to it, what do you do? You treat every day as God's gift and you embrace everything that it brings. 
So that's what the teacher from our first reading had to say, and we'll look at what Paul can teach us about the future. Um, but for now, we're going to sing again, and I believe the singing group are going to come up for our next hymn, He Will Hold Me Fast. So if we continue to look at what we can learn from our passages today, we can look at our second reading and Paul. And how, how did Paul deal with the heaviness, the unpredictability of his own life? So today is our last reading in our series going through Acts. And so for the last one, we've skipped right towards the end, and it comes in one of Paul's many trials. Part of the unpredictability of Paul's life was that he was always being hauled before up courts he would be pulled before some governor or some judge or someone in order to answer for his supposed crimes and this time Paul was brought before King Herod Agrippa II. Now King Herod Agrippa II was a Roman puppet king and if you want to get a sense of who this guy was you just need to see his family tree. Um, so who's in that family tree? Well, his father was Herod Agrippa I. Uh, he had the apostle James killed. Uh, his great uncle was Herod Antipas. He was the one who had John the Baptist head served him on a platter as a wedding gift. And right at the top of that tree, you'll see uh, Herod the Great. Um, how well do you remember your uh, nativity story? 
Do you remember what happened to the children of Bethlehem? This is the family we're talking about. So our King Agrippa in our story comes from a long line of these Herods who had this distinguished track record of ridding themselves of any turbulent priests that got in their way. And this was the chap that Paul was pulled before in order to make his case. Yet again, finding himself in another dangerous situation that he never could have predicted. But nevertheless, Paul did what he always did. He told his story. I do think it's really interesting in Acts because you can tell from the rest of the Bible, Paul is a great debater. He can construct watertight arguments. You know, he's really good at that stuff. But whenever he's asked to speak and defend himself, his go-to is always to tell his own story and share about his own life. I think it's a good reminder that whilst arguments have their place, that when you're trying to convince them of someone, someone of something, particularly in that kind of one-to-one -one space, actually telling your own story can be much more effective. But Paul told the assembled crowd who he was. He went right back and said, you know, I was once the strictest of all the Pharisees. I was a zealous man who persecuted and even killed Christians. But then I met Jesus on the road to Damascus and it changed my whole perspective. I used to hate Jesus and everything he stood for, but now I believe that Jesus is the hope of the world and I've given my whole life to him. And as we read today, he said to the crowd, I stand here giving my witness to all, small and great alike, that Jesus rose to them the dead and that he is the hope of the world. Now, I don't know if you caught this in the reading. At this point, um, the Roman governor, Festus, seemingly lost his cool, and he sort of just screams out in front of everyone, you're mad, Paul. Your great learning is driving you mad. And Paul just sort of sidesteps it. It's a really strange little detail, but I find it hilarious. Anyway, so after sidestepping the governor, thinking that he'd lost the plot, he, he turns to King Agrippa, this man, the great grandson of Herod the Great, and he says, uh, you've read the prophets just like me. Don't you think it could be true? And King Agrippa, interestingly, doesn't disagree with them, but instead he replies saying, do you really think that in such a short time you can persuade me to become a Christian? And he had a point. This guy was a king. He was a cosmopolitan member of Roman high society, and not to mention that family tree. The idea that he would become a follower of this peasant from Galilee, it was absurd. Paul was being ridiculous for even entertaining the idea. But Paul replied, short time or long, I pray to God that not only you, but all of you who are listening to me today become what I am. And possibly just for a bit of comedic effect, it says like I am, except for the chains. But he says to them, I think you can become like me. Did Paul know if Agrippa was going to become a Christian? No. Like everything else in Paul's life, that was out of his hands. But what he did have was hope. Hope that even someone like King Agrippa could change. And that hope was rooted in his own story. And I think that's another reason why he always starts with his own story. Because he knew how much he had changed. He had gone from someone who killed people who disagreed with them to becoming someone who put his own life on the line to tell people about Jesus. And if he could change, anyone could change. Paul didn't know the future, but what he had was an unshakable belief in the power of God's love to change even the most stubborn person. And so Paul was willing to take risks, even put his own life on the line, trusting that God is in control. I mentioned right back in our notices that we had our first um, Friday, the, the family drop-in, uh, and how it did go well, actually. We had an interesting mix of people. It was nice to see some old faces and new. Um, I had a really good time there, but I've, if I'm honest with you, I spent a lot of this week worrying about it. I find new projects really hard. You never know who's going to turn up. If they do turn up, you don't know if it's going to go well, and you don't know if there's one thing that you've forgotten that means the whole thing is going to go down the drain. It maybe it sounds a bit ridiculous, but I, I worry so much about these things before we do new things in church. Um, it, and it's the uncertainty. It's not knowing what the future that's going to bring that causes that worry. I felt the same when we started our ACORN group a little while ago, and when we started doing family worship, 
But I'm so glad that those fears didn't get in the way of actually starting these things, because in each case, I've been surprised at all the different ways that God's been at work. And it's been really encouraging to see the different ways that, yeah, that we can see God's spirit at work in our community and among people. But it took taking a risk on something that I didn't know how it was going to go. I really want to learn to be more like Paul. To be the kind of person who has the courage to say, I don't know what the future holds, but here's what I can do right here and right now. In another part of the Bible, Paul describes the work he does like this. He says, um, I planted the seeds. Apollos, that was one of his colleagues he worked with, Apollos watered it, but it is God who's been making it grow. Sowing seeds is only a small action. And it takes a long time for a seed to grow to a tree, and not every seed will make it. But those that do, they grow far outside their original size. We can't control our future just as you can't grow a tree in a day, but we can keep sowing seeds. So as we go into a future that we don't know what's going to happen, all sorts of things could happen, good or bad, we will never know exactly what the future holds. It's unpredictable. But the Bible gives us two voices that I think can help us. It gives us the teacher who asks us to let go of our desire to control the future and to enjoy the present that we've been given. And Paul, who challenges us to trust in God and have courage to do what we can with the opportunities we've been given. Now, speaking of unpredictability, here's an unpredictable thing. I forgot to think of a question. <laughs> uh, Let's have just a few minutes to chat. How do you deal when life throws you a curveball, <laughs> when things are a little bit unexpected? How do you find it and what helps you the most? And um, if you want to turn to the people next to you, if you're in church, if you're on Zoom, you'll have a few minutes uh, in a breakout room and then we'll come together to continue our worship.
We will have more time to finish these conversations uh, after the service. I realized it's only a, a few weeks ago that I um, did a service on encouragement. Now it's a sermon on uh, dealing with unpredictability. I feel like it's just a long campaign to make sure you're nice to me when I fluff things up from the front. But now we're going to do our prayers for others. And um, so if there are any names you'd like included in the prayers, if you want to, if you're in the church, shout them out. If you're on Zoom, if you want to type them into the chat function and we'll include them in the prayers. Jill? Susan and Stuart. Oh, I got a few there. So I think I heard Michelle. Uh, who else spoke there? Sarah. Rosemary. Helen and Evelyn. Are there any other names? Uh, Zoom, yes. Scarlet. Let us pray. Loving God, we value so much that we can come to you as an unchanging God. When life can feel like it has no anchor, we are grateful that you are always uh, a safe haven for us. No matter what we're going through, we can always turn to you. And we pray that we do that in hard times, in good times, in celebrations and in mornings, whatever is happening in our lives, we pray that we remember to include you, to turn to you first and to rely on you through all things. We pray though for a world with so much uncertainty, and so many unpredictable futures. We pray especially today for the situation in Afghanistan. We pray for all the people whose lives have been uprooted who are fleeing for fear of violence. We pray that they will be kept safe, that they will find safe refuge. We pray for everyone working in that region and we pray for wise leadership and compassion to be the spirits of all the world leaders, all the important people working in that region. We bring before you also uh, a nation where lots of things are up in the air. We pray for everyone who's waiting on results, everybody who's unsure if they're going to get something or not. We pray for people who are in limbo, people who feel like they don't quite know where their life is going. There are so many reasons why we can feel that life is uncertain and that we're not sure of what the future brings. And often that can be a quite a scary place to be. So we pray that you are with everyone who is in that place, uncertain of where the future is. Help them to feel at peace in the moment, able to enjoy the present day as it is, and help them to look to the future with the knowledge that you will be with them through every situation. And we pray for everyone whose names are on our minds and hearts today. We pray for the family of Winnie, for Joe, for Susan and Stuart, for Michelle, for Sarah, for Rosemary, for Helen and Evelyn, for Pat, Norman and Scarlett, and we pray for everyone else who we might be thinking of today. Loving God, you know every situation, and so we entrust these people into your caring hands. We don't know what the future holds for them, but we know that you will be with them always, that you will never leave them or abandon them, and for that we are truly grateful. So help us to go forward into this week and make the most of every day. Let us celebrate the days we are given as gifts and help us to have the courage to step out in faith, to use the opportunities we are given to bring light and love into the lives of others and in, to enjoy the good things that you have blessed us with as well. So be with us, encourage and strengthen us each and every day, we pray. Amen. We'll now close with our final hymn, we'll sing Look Forward in Faith.
So look forward in faith and may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with each of you this day and evermore. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Please Amen. be Amen. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you to everyone on Zoom. Thank you to everyone who attended in person. Uh, if you're on Zoom, uh, please do enjoy some time chatting to each other uh, after the service. And for everyone here, you're welcome to join us for tea and coffee after the service. Um, but thank you for being here and may God bless you through the rest of this week.